you, get a, you also get an invariant. So there's lots of different, so the point is there's lots of different algebraic modifications you can do, and as long as you're doing something sensible, well, you're gonna get out a non-invariant. All right, so now let's talk about the Kronitz formula. Great, and so the Kronitz formula it's much like the Kronitz formula for three manifolds. So it says that uh, the knot flow complex for the connected sum of two knots um, is chain homotopic to, well, just take the tensor product um, over the ground ring of the knot flow complexes for uh, each of your knots. Right, and you can sort of, um, if you want to work with any of the simpler flavors that are over some simpler ring, you just take the, ten the tensor product over whatever ring you're working with. You can just check that algebraically. That follows. Through. All right, uh, so what are some other things we'd like to do with knots? Maybe you take the mirror of your knot. So say if this is k, take the mirror of k. So that's just reversing the um, orientation of S3. So in terms of a diagram, uh, that's just uh, changing all the signs of all of the crossings. Great. And the knot flow complex behaves nicely under mirroring. Um, in the sense that the knot full complex of the mirror of K is homotopy equivalent to um, the dual of the knot flow complex of K. So by dual, I mean um, F adjoin UV homomorphisms uh, from this complex uh, to the ground ring. And then the gratings do what the gratings do. All right, so let's uh, let's sketch the proof of this. So let's suppose that H is a Hagar diagram for K. All right, so how can we obtain a Hagar diagram for the mirror of K? Well, the mirror of K is obtained by uh, reversing the orientation of the ambient three manifold. <coughs> and then, uh, so, right, so if H is the Hagar diagram for K, then, well, if we just reverse the orientation of the surface, um, I guess that was one of your exercises from Monday, which to show that this uh, reverses the orientation of the three manifold. So this is a Hagar diagram for minus k. Because reversing orientation here reverses the orientation of S3. <coughs> All right, so now we have two Hagar diagrams that are very closely related. So in particular, um, there's a canonical identification between the generators of the chain complex associated, associated to this diagram and the one associated to this one. Uh, so we have a canonical identification between uh, the generators of uh, CFK of H and CFK of H prime, right? But now notice we change the orientation of sigma. Um, so that's gonna change the orientation of uh, sim g of sigma. And so now, if you think about what happens, right? So remember, we were counting these disks um, from x to y. 
And we've required our disks to sort of see alpha on the right and beta on the left. Something like this. <coughs> right, so if we saw a disk from x to y in CFK of h, well, if you reverse the orientation of sigma, now in CFK of h prime, this is going to be a disk going the other direction from y to x. And so that's going to happen to every disk that we counted, and that's exactly going to give us the dual. So the point is that phi in pi 2 uh, from x to y, so phi in pi 2 from x to y in C of k of h corresponds to uh, phi prime going the other way in C of k of h prime. And sort of going the other way is exactly taking the dual. All right, so that's what happens when we take the mirror. What's another thing that people uh, like to do to knots? Well, you can take the reverse of k, um, which is to reverse the string orientation. Uh, so if this is k, then we can take the reverse. Uh, so you keep the crossings the same, and then you just change the string orientation. I guess in the case of the trestle, these are actually the same oriented knot. But in general, reversing the string orientation can change your oriented knot. I did not mean to change. The, oh, no. I didn't mean to change the crossings. Thanks. No, the crossings are the same. Thank you. Okay, so now let's, um, what does this do to the knot flow complex? And in fact, it actually, it does nothing. So knot flow homology does not see the string orientation. All right, so. <coughs> let's sketch the proof. So. Suppose we have a Hager diagram for K. OK. Um, so now let's see. If we want to get the, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the reverse of K in the following way. I'm going to reverse the orientation of sigma. I'm going to switch alpha and beta. And then I'm going to keep my base points in the same order. So let's convince ourselves that this really is um, the reverse of k. OK, so just in terms of the three manifold, um, reversing the orientation of sigma reverses the orientation of, of S3. But we also switched alpha and beta. And if you switch alpha and beta, that also changes the orientation of S3. So we basically we reverse the orientation twice. So we kept the orientation the same. <coughs> but now remember how we formed our knot. Right? We connect W to Z in the alpha handle body and Z to W in the beta handle body. But now we've um, sort of switched which is the alpha handle body and which is the beta handle body. So now, now, well, here W went to Z in the alpha handle body. But in the alpha handle body, now it's going in the opposite direction. So this really is the reverse. OK. And so now, well, just as before in the case of mirroring, there's a canonical identification between the generators. <coughs> and now also, in fact, the, that identification doesn't just identify the generators. It actually also identifies the differential. Because, well, we reverse the orientation of sigma. 
but we also switch the alphas and betas, right? So if you have something, uh, so the point is if you see, if you saw a disk like this uh, from x to y in sim g of sigma, well now, if you switch the alphas and betas, the red and the blue switch, but if you also switch, if you also switch the orientation of sigma, um, right, so now we're going to uh, look at something like this uh, in sim g of minus sigma. Um, and so sort of those two, the two, those two switchings um, sort of cancel out. And so we get a, a canonical identification between the two chain complexes. Choice of Hager diagram to describe the reverse of K. Maybe if you if you think about it, I could have I could have done something else to this Hager diagram to obtain a doubly pointed Hager diagram for for the reverse of K, right? I could have just swapped Z and W. If you think about the definition of the oriented knot associated to a doubly pointed Hager diagram, if you swap Z and W to keep everything else fixed, that will reverse the orientation of the knot. So, no. If this is a Hager diagram for K, well, if I just swap Z and W, this is a Hager diagram for the reverse. So we know from over here that the um, chain complex associated to the reverse is homotopy equivalent to the chain complex for K. So in particular, well, right, W sort of tells us what to do with the variable U, and Z tells us what to do with the variable V. So what does this observation tell us? This tells us that the chain complex is symmetric under switching U and V. So um, uh, it's symmetric up to chain homotopy equivalence under switching U and V. So. Symmetric um, in U and V, sort of up to homotopy. Great. Um, so if you look back to our, our computation for the uh, trefoil, you can see that, that that indeed is true. If you reverse the voles of U and V, um, then you also need to sort of reverse the U and V gradings appropriately, uh, but you'll get, you'll get back the same chain complex. Questions? Okay, so maybe, maybe one question you might have is, how do you compute this? All right, so I guess we did, we did one example, the trefoil, um, and, and in fact, sort of, if you're not, um, has a genus one doubly pointed Hagar diagram, then, then you can just compute it from the definition. So if you use the Riemann ma mapping theorem to figure out sort of which disks account, um, and, and you can just do it. So if K admits a genus one doubly pointed Hagar diagram, Um, you can compute this directly. Uh, so maybe you're wondering, well, how many knots admit a genus one doubly pointed Hager diagrams? Lots of them do. So for example, all torus knots um, admit genus one uh, Hager diagrams, and they're sort of, but they're like a proper subset of all the knots that admit genus one Hager diagrams. 
Okay, but, well, there's also lots of knots that don't admit genus one Hagar diagrams. How might you hope to compute the knot flow homology for those knots? Um, so one way is via something called a grid diagram. Uh, so these are defined by Manolescu, uh, Ashvath, Sarkar, and also Manolescu, Ashvath, Zabo, and Thurston. Great. So what is a grid diagram? A grid diagram is um, a sort of a generalization of the Hagar diagrams I described for you on Monday. Um, it's some sort of it's some sort of multi-pointed Hagar diagra diagram. So, um, you know, you have you have a genus one surface, and instead of having a single alpha circle and a single beta circle, you have lots of alpha circles, lots of beta circles, and then lots of extra base points, and then you deal with everything in an appropriate way. And um, great, so this is some sort of multi-pointed. Hagar diagram. And the advantage of grid diagrams is that things become con entirely combinatorial. Um, so it's combinatorial, which is great. You can tell a computer to do it. Um, the downside is that the chain complexes that you get are very large. So you have large chain complexes. Um, Right, so you're not is drawn in some sort of n by n grid, and the number of generators you get is n factorial. So you have n factorial generators for an n by n grid. Um, and so, so for example, um, the tref for the trefoil, you need a five by five grid. So that's already 120 generators. And then for the figure eight, you actually need a six by six grid. And then it just gets worse from there. Um, OK, what other ways? What other ways are there to compute uh, not flow homology? Um, so there's a, there's a uh, fast algorithm for uh, not quite the full uh, not flow complex, but the uh, uh, UV equals zero complex. Uh, so this is by Ajrath and Zabo. Um, this is using something called uh, using uh, bordered algebras. Um, maybe the caveat, one caveat is I guess I better put quotes around this, because um, what's currently uh, available is um, they, they define some other knot invariant that they conjecture is equivalent to this, and they're they will prove that it's equivalent, but sort of right now it's written down as that it's conjecturally equivalent to this, and that, that, that invariant that's conjecturally equivalent to this, they can compute pretty quickly. Um, and in fact, there's, there's a um, program on Zoltan's website. To compute this. And this is, this is um, significantly faster than, than grid diagrams. The complexes that you get are much smaller. Okay, so those are sort of the algorithms for computing this. Um, but, but for other families of knots, you actually, you can actually deduce what um, the knot flow complex is from simpler invariants. So for example, um, the knot flow complex of uh, K for K alternating. Uh, is completely determined by uh, two classical invariants. So by the Alexander polynomial and the signature. Uh, 
Um, so in fact, um, for HFK hat, the statement is quite simple. Uh, so remember, HFK hat is a bi-graded vector space whose graded Euler characteristic is the Alexander polynomial. Um, and it turns out that for K alternating, um, HFK hat is supported um, on the diagonal, uh, so I'm going to use the um, Alexander and U grading, so it's supported on the diagonal M equals S plus sigma of K over 2. Uh, so this is uh, with respect to the U grading and Alexander grading. Right, and so um, if you know that it's supported on a single diagonal and you know it's graded Euler characteristic, that actually entirely determines the graded vector space. Um, so that's one family of knots for which uh, the knot flow complex is determined entirely by classical invariance. And then there's another family for which the same statement is true. So if K admits a surgery to an L space, um, so remember, an L space is a Hager floor homology lens space. So a, Hager, uh, a rational homology sphere with the same Hager floor homology as the lens space. Um, uh, then, then it turns out that the knot flow complex uh, is entirely de determined by the Alexander polynomial. So for example, um, uh, all torus knots admit uh, lens space surgeries. So for all torus knots, you can compute the knot flow complex uh, from the Alexander polynomial. And so it turns out that these facts combined with the Kronos formula actually gives you sort of a, a large family of examples of sort of um, interesting uh, knot flow complexes. Um, and so that's all I want to tell you today. And so tomorrow we'll talk about the relationship between this knot flow complex and the Hager flow homology of a surgery on your knot. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Can you say a little bit about what supported that example? Oh, yes. Um, Okay, so there's something called bordered flow homology, which is an invariant of three manifolds with boundary. And it has the property, right? So, um, it's an invariant of three manifolds with a, a parametrized boundary. And so if you want to, and then it has the nice feature that if you want to get to glue together two three manifolds with boundary to get a closed three manifold, you take some appropriate tensor product of the bordered invariant, and that recovers the Hager flow homology of the closed three manifold. And then, okay, and then, and then what Oshroth and Zabo do is some sort of um, like relative version of that. So uh, they put their knot in bridge position. And then if you put your knot in bridge position, well then, then you can chop it up into pieces that all are either caps or cups or crossings. And then to sort of each of these, um, to, each, to each of these different uh, pieces that you have, sort of these just sort of simple moves, they associate uh, invariant, and then if you want to get your not invariant, well, you just, you're gluing these things up, so you're taking some appropriate tensor product of the pieces, and then that gives you back the not invariant. That's right, yeah. So the question is sort of how, how do these knot flow complexes I described relate to the ambient three manifold? Because um, you can sort of do the construction. Uh, I'm focused, here we're focusing on knots in S3, but sort of this works more generally for a knot in any three manifold. And then there's a relationship between these invariants and the Hager flow homology of the ambient three manifold. Um, right, so I guess 
Uh, we saw that if you set v equal to 1, you got back h of minus of s3. Um, tomorrow we'll actually look, we'll see what happens if we re-invert v, so we can tensor with f adjoin v, v inverse, and then um, that also in a suitable way recovers uh, the Hegel homology of the ambient three manifold. So basically, basically you do algebraic modifications with your variables. You think about what that meant in terms of what disks you're counting in the chain complex, and then if you did it sort of in a suitable way, then you'll see that you're actually just counting the things you would have been counting for the three manifold invariant. Um, yes. So on th at the end of Monday, I described an algorithm given a, a knot diagram to produce a Hager diagram for that knot. Right, we, started with, we started with a projection, and then we built, we built this uh, diagram, and then we put in the right alpha and beta curves. <coughs> um, there's a definition of the Alexander polynomial in terms of Kaufman states. So you sort of, it's in terms of a projection and then you sort of, you decorate your crossings in, a, in an appropriate way. And then sort of you, these come with some gradings and then sort of you sum over states and you get the Alexander polynomial. <coughs> it turns out that there is a bijection between these Kaufman states and the generators that come from this Hagar diagram. And then it turns out if you also um, sort of understand the, the gradings of the these generators, they actually sort of exactly line up with sort of the gradients that you compute for the Kaufman states. And right, so if you want to know the graded Euler characteristic of the homology of a chain complex, you actually don't need to know the differential. You just need to know that the chain, if you know, the, if you know that it's a graded chain complex and the differential lowers grading by one, it's sufficient to know the, um, just the underlying vector space together with the gradings. And it turns out that this bijection sort of um, gives you one proof that the uh, that now for homology categorifies the Alexander polynomial. <coughs> no, no other questions? Ah, uh, yes. Oh, do all concordance invariants coming from not for homology has the same information as signature? The answer is sort of emphatically no. Um, so there's sort of the, the first concordance invariant to come from Knopfler homology was the tau invariant defined by um, Peter and Zoltan. And um, the tau invariant gave a new proof of Milner's conjecture about um, the unknotting number of torus knots. And so in particular, the signature doesn't tell you the unknotting number of torus knots, but tau does. Um, and then, um, yeah, sort of, I, I, I spent a lot of my mathematical life um, deriving concordance invariants from Knopfler homology and sort of they, they can tell you things that signature cannot. For example, um, they can tell you things about topologically sliced knots, which the signature cannot. All right. Thanks.